I'm joined tonight on the Electro Wave Show by Steve Wright and David Crickmore of the band Fiat Lux. Formed in 1982, they had a number of singles in the early 80s and a much acclaimed mini album, Hide History. They reformed again in 2017 to re-release uh, Hide History along with a number of unreleased tracks as a precursor to the release of the last album, Save Symmetry. They're currently working on material for a new album and have a new single, How Will We Ever Work This Way, released on June the 19th. Evening guys, how are you all doing? Hello Stuart. Hi Hi, Stuart. Thank you. how are you doing? Good, all good mate, thanks. I'm just um, really glad to have you on the show. Uh, I mentioned in, before we started the conversation that big fans of you, your guys in the 80s and also the music you've been doing recently as well. Um, but lockdown's caused a few problems I think. So how's lockdown affected you creatively? Well, it's kind of split us apart, really, in terms of being able to get together to progress the material that we're working on currently, hasn't it, Steve? Yes, it has. Um, notwithstanding that, I mean, it's, it's, it's still going on while the lockdown's happening. I mean, I've, I've written a couple of things and been able, luckily, through technology to send them over to David to get his thoughts, get his opinions, and, and uh, to hopefully, well, he has um, in his masterful way started working on them already which is which is great and um, so it has been a it has been a binding that we can't actually physically get together in the same space and, and experiment with stuff which is what we like to do yes so, so in, in fact what's what's happened ha has been that you know we got so far with the album and there are a certain amount of stuff that was done before the lockdown which we have been able to progress and then there's been a few things where as, as steve says you know with things between each other in in one way or another but actually what we're really wanting is is to get steve's physical presence now to actually start recording vocals to make any of the other tracks move further if you see what i mean how many tracks have you got complete so far of the new album or is it you, what percentage of way there do you think i think we're about halfway there i would say we've got six or seven tracks that, that are in some form of uh, of order um and budgeting ideas for a few more so we're, 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 we're getting there we probably would have got further had it not been for the last few weeks of, uh, of not being able to see each other. So how did yeah. the new album come around, come about? Did it, was it something you've been thinking about for a while or was it just a spur of the moment thing? I think it's, it was a natural progression, isn't it? It's, um, we, we got so far with the um, with uh, uh, Safe Symmetry and also spurred on with Arc of Embers, but doing the live stuff and then new material comes along, new ideas come up and one by one we found that we had some really nice and interesting tracks that we could put together and it, it's just it's just grown from there really i think we, we just kind of now we're back together again we just kind of capture moments when we can to to progress things so it's almost like obviously we spent quite a bit of time getting together the the live um, fiat lux proposition because that was a brand new thing for this century basically so we, we spent the sort of summer months getting ready for those awesome gigs and then once we'd established that that works and we would put the, the work in there it was the next natural thing to keep us occupied with Fiat Lux was to get going on, on more material um, and so you know that, that's it's just a kind of a, a natural thing that just keeps jollying on really there's we don't sort of say right let's set our diary for particular month to do album recording it, it just it's just come along hasn't it? it's the next thing well that's uh, right and also um if we're going to do more live stuff we need to have some new stuff so hmm. you know that, that kind of focuses the mind as well because people don't want to you know not the same set again or whatever no no we wouldn't do that to them dear me no 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 no, no, no. <laughs> so what the challenge has been of of um, rec you know playing live again after 35 years i mean i guess the technology's changed for a start yes the technology has changed uh, i think the biggest challenge and steve won't mind me saying this was that we weren't sh sure how steve would react to playing live again after not actually having done it since 1985 84 84 84 85 yeah. yeah so i mean we didn't know what that was going to be like until steve walked onto the first stage in our bradford gig when we did our sort of return gig uh, last October. So Steve, how did you feel about doing that? Very nervous. I mean, it's one thing when you're 23, 24 to, to sort of go and, well, let's say, you know, perform um, music. 
um, 35 years on, having not done it at all, it was very strange. And I have to say, I was very, very nervous, but it seemed to go okay. Did you enjoy it? It went very that? well. <laughs> and I think um, <laughs> what, what was funny about it was that, um, you know, obviously we put lots of work into into getting the, the show going, so we knew how it, how it should be and everything. But obviously nerves Absolutely. creeping creeping on, on the night. Um, and we had a humorous situation on that on that first gig where there was a problem with some of the house lights and it happened just as we were due to go on for our bit and for some reason or other nobody could switch off the house lights in a certain part of the room um, and and I could see Steve riding against this you know he was getting really frustrated as we were waiting yeah. backstage to, to, to you know and, and I think that turned out to be a really good thing because it completely took you off the, the worry of the gig <laughs> you were kind of focused on getting the lights off. Yeah. And Can someone not find one switch to turn those lights <laughs> off? And, you know, it's I a church, the funny thing know? about it in the end was that uh, the gig went fine and everything, but when we came back, we discovered that the switch to switch those lights off was actually right by where we were standing <laughs> as we were waiting to get on. <laughs> So that must have made it a bit easier when you, you, the lights would just go off and you're right, you're on now sort of thing. You don't have time to think yeah. about it almost. You're just straight on, you know. Yeah. So we were doing some more live gigs um, after the album's released, do you think? I know we're, we're... Well, we were, we were set to do live gigs. Um, you know, there, there, was, there was one due, when was it, Steve? May. Um, <laughs> yes. We, we were kind, we were kind of getting them all in as it was you know before the lockdown and of course things have had to stop because of the lockdown so we were we were not um we were not in a position where we hadn't got any more live gigs it's just that we, we haven't been able to do them basically so they're all stockpiling for the future now are you still going to be doing live gigs though oh yes definitely i mean it, it was a great experience going back to doing live again um i think the first one in prep was a kind of experiment to see what it would be like and um, we'd already said yes to a couple of festivals at that point because i think when um the hired history plus came out and the new album and people realized we were active again we, we we got some offers so we thought well that's great we said yes to them on, and we thought well we can't just go and do these festivals we better set up our own gig and see how it goes and then we could always quietly back down if it went terribly you know <laughs> um, but as it turned out the Bradford gig that we set up for ourselves was was, was lovely in every in, in every way um, and, and spurred us on and, and it was just what we needed to to be ready for these uh, slightly bigger affairs I did see the feedback on uh, Facebook from it and everyone seemed to enjoy it and, you know, really did have a good time at the gig. The, the audience was, was, was lovely. The audience were great and it's, it's kind of like a family thing. The, the people, some people came from Germany, some people came from Smithonia, some people came from Devon, you know, uh, just specifically for the gig in Bradford, which was Brilliant. really heartening, really. Yeah. You did um, the old grey whistle test back in the 80s as well. Um, mm -hmm. How did that gig come around? Because it's that's one of the most iconic um, live music shows that's been in the world, as far as I'm concerned. You know, anybody who should play on there has played on there. Yes, I mean we were we were on it during its its, its latter days, really. So it was it was later than the sort of classic Bob Harris era that people remember. Um, it was when it was in the hands of David Hepworth and, and Mark Elland. Uh, they took it over to give it a more sort of 1980s cred, I think, uh, as far as the BBC producers were concerned. Um, and so it came about just around the time when Blue Emotion, our, our single, was, was out when we put that out with Polydor. Um, and I think it coincided with them wanting to do something that focused on synthesizers. Um, so I think those two things combined to, to get us the gig, basically enjoy it yeah it was great um it was an interesting it one was because hmm? it was odd it, there was a there was a what was it a scenes and props strike david am that's I right? right yeah that's right i was and just so, about to say yeah yeah so so um in lieu of any kind of props or scenes or whatever um mind you in the old days of bob harris they didn't have proper scenes did they no, it was just in a no. bare studio but uh, in in the new mood of things so what they did was they, they wheeled in some huge back projection mirrors into the studio. So bare studio is back projection mirrors, which we were told at the time were at last used on Z cars, if you remember Z cars. <laughs> no, I don't. Clearly not. It's far too I, young. I, I'm interested. <laughs> it, it, 
<laughs> is, my, is my memory correct? Because I think that they, they put it in front of some black drapes and said, there you are, lads, that'll have to do. And did we not spot those mirrors and say that would be more interesting? It could well, could well have been the case, yeah. yeah but I think it, so, because I don't, think that was, some, uh... I don't think that was planned for us. I think we just thought, well, it's got to be better than this, um, because obviously their, their usual logory wasn't available because nobody would shift it. But luckily these mirrors were on big wheels, so it was easy for us to sort of shift them into the into the way of the camera and Bob's your uncle. Well, except he wasn't because he wasn't there. <laughs> Stuart, Stuart, you've you've got to Google Z cars. I do remember Z cars, if I'm perfectly frank with you, I do remember. <laughs> Um, yes, they, they always contravened the law by driving the cars in the middle of a white line, didn't they? That was it. Yeah, yeah. they did. Yeah. So I guess you can find that um, that um, old grey whistle test piece of uh, video on YouTube, I presume. That's right. Yes, we did. Yep. We did two uh, songs for it, as was the way. Really, uh, we did um, the moment, I believe, and Blue Emotion, the, the, the current single, during yeah. the course of it. Yep. And I think also on the on, on it that night was film footage from Kraftwerk. Uh, and Jean-Michel Jarre and various other synthesizer right. terms. So speaking of singles, uh, your new single's out on June the 19th. Yeah. Um, we had the first play on, on Artifact Radio, which we were very honoured to do. Thank you very much for that. Well, thank you for doing it. That was great. It really was great. And I have to say, once we put the um, the playback up on, on the mix club, we had a good good number of hits of, of listening to the music. And I actually mm. see the graph of who listens, well, not who listens, but what is listened to at what time and a number of people listened to the, the playback and there was a mm. peak <laughs> at eight minutes when we played uh, your, your new single so uh, <laughs> it was a lot of Fiat Lux fans that had a good, a good listen to that, that new track. Tell us about the new single then. Well it's, um, it's one of the sort of early um, songs that we'd put together uh, ready for the new album and I suppose we wouldn't have put it out at this stage necessarily um, had it not been for the lockdown. But when we realised that things were going to have to sort of be um, put on hold for a bit, we thought it would be, and, and we couldn't do the, the gig that we had uh, in, in May that we were hoping to do. We thought, well, this is going to look like lack of activity and we have at least got this really strong song uh, that was destined for the album, um, which was more or less com complete. The only thing it didn't have on it was uh, Will's saxophone part. Uh, but the good thing was it had all Steve's vocals complete on it, which is the, it was the key thing because the one thing we couldn't do was get Steve down to the studio to do vocals uh, once the lockdown rules were in force. Um, but what I was able to do was to drop a little bit of kit on the doorstep of Will Howard, our saxophone player, and he had his own means of, uh, of using a laptop and uh, with a little bit of tuition was able to do a rather smart saxophone part in his back bedroom under a oh, sheet. Right. <laughs> and that's what we used to complete the track and I was able to mix that um, and you know we passed it to and fro and just, do you like this do you like that bit and everything and once we were all happy with it um, we, we got it mastered and there it is uh, it, I think it's just a great song to, to, to stand up for what we're doing at the moment and yeah. to give people an idea of uh, what we're working on how we're progressing a track at a time where otherwise we wouldn't be able to do that yeah the track's called um how we ever work this way and yes. it's it, to me it's it is very fierce locks with the bass coming in very very early as well mm. uh, you just as i said on the show it's, it's, that's the fiat locks bass coming in straight away you know yes. and um it's, it's had some good uh, good uh, reviews so far i think it's been it's been quite a bit of airplay as well and yes. uh rusty egan's taken hold of it and uh, done a little tweak to it as well and he's been he played has, on yes. his show, which is quite good. You met Rusty a few uh, last year, I think, didn't you? Yes, we did. When we were doing one of these festival gigs we were referring to, uh, we, he, he took us under his wing a little bit. We were on the same bill and the same stage, weren't we, Steve? Yeah, he was, he kind of very graciously sort of, uh, he was doing a disco set before us and he very graciously sort of took our suggestion that we don't need a, an introduction. He just let the, the his, his ultimate track fade out and our intro track fade in and he was really good really good to us he was yes and uh, spent a bit of time at the bar with him i believe steve <laughs> <laughs> yeah i did <laughs> <laughs> yeah i did and a uh, very interesting guy very us uh, well one of he's just excellent to talk to really good. he's got so well, many stories he's, he's, yeah he's excellent to listen to as well yeah mm -hmm. 
just going back to the very start when you guys all first met, how did you all meet and um, and how was the band formed? David? Well, um, we were both uh, students at a, a, a university, um, well, it's, it's an adjunct of Leeds University called Bretton Hall College, which was a wonderful capability brown sort of Jane Austen like mansion house uh, just outside of Wakefield. Uh, and we both attended sort of artsy degree courses there and, and kind of um, just met up as a result of that. Um, and we were in a, a college band together, Steve and I. Um, and then after Steve left a little bit earlier than I did, uh, and, and you um, went into doing acting and things, didn't you, Steve? Uh, I and did. That's, and, and that's where really things started with Fiat Lux, wasn't it? When you were out and about performing well, and I was, I was sort of at the tail end of the college thing. Yeah, I was, I was uh, briefly in a, in a theatre company called Yorkshire Actors Company and uh, they involved Bill Nelson, bless him, uh, as, uh, to write some music for the, for the for the theatre shows that we did. And that's how I met Bill. And one time I was uh, just sitting in rehearsals and he said, so what are you up to now? As you came along to watch some of the action so we could put music to it. So I'm writing a couple of songs, actually. I've, I've done some songs. Don't know if they're any good. So we'll send me a copy. So I went immediately to David, who has the technical know-how and the musical acumen and skill to be able to sort of weave my naive attempts into something that's listenable, toable. And uh, we sent them to Bill, who he loved them, and released um, Feels Like Winter Again on Cocteau, on his Cocteau label. And this illness was on the B-side. And we were following on from, I think, the Skids and... Uh, who was the other one? Skids and Flock of Seagulls. Hmm. Okay. They, they, all, the, they uh, all cut their teeth on Cocteau and then went on to, to better things. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It kind of, kind of started. And so, and that, that's how I feel like started, because um, Bill showed an interest. David and I were making music and so we started doing pubs and clubs in and around Wakefield. Ian came to see us at one gig and I think his words were, I think that's incredibly brave of you two to stand up there and do that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, okay, do you fancy some of it yourself? And he said, well, yeah. That, that, so, and that, that's how Ian came in. We, we, we met Ian after we met Bill. It wasn't a case of Ian was in the band and introduced us to Bill and that's how it happened. It was, it was uh, completely the other way around, yeah. yeah. The other way around, yeah. Well, we were brave, David, to, to stand well, there. Well, I suppose so. I mean, it, it was early days of that kind of thing, you know. There weren't that many people yeah. sort of going along with, a, with, you know, with primitive bits of kit and backing tapes. There were a few and, I mean, you can hear, you can hear examples of it on the, that um, electric language al um, album that came out through Cherry Red last year, which we've got a track on. That there, were, there were, you know, odd bod people making this DIY music that was more electronic than it was punk around that sort of early 80s time. But, you know, you didn't see a lot of it live. You didn't see, you know. Yeah. But, but we went into sort of grotty old pubs in, in the Wakefield district and, and had to go up performing this stuff <laughs> in front of you know, a vaguely disinterested audience. <laughs> and that's why I think Ian thought we were brave. So what were your input? I think the most high... Sorry, sorry, Stuart. Go no, on. go on, Steve, carry on. I, I was going to say, David, I think the most high-tech piece of kit we had was that copycat um, echo thing, wasn't it? The, yes, we had a, a copycat. We had a, some sort of a Casio keyboard and, um, and a, a drum box, which was made by Electra Harmonics, which was almost... It was just kind of like a foot pedal. I wish I still had it. It made some interesting noises. <laughs> what, who were your influences uh, in the music you were making when you were doing Hyde History and uh, in your other tracks? Well, I think it was a, a real cornucopia of things, really. I mean, once once we got to the stage where there was a bit of money to, for us to um, to actually spend time in the studio and, 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 and craft things, which we tended to do in the Polydor, Hugh Jones era, um, all sorts of things sort of informed what we were doing. I mean, I think everybody in that sort of early 80s period, you were 20 years back from the sort of psychedelic period of the, the Beatles and, and the like. There was definitely a bit of that in there. But there was also, uh, you were also informed a bit by, by the punk era of that kind of, you can do what you like, do it yourself kind yeah. of approach. You know, 
and then there were lots of great bands you know at the time that that that, that you know you, you're always listening to the new thing and what's this new thing that's come out that, that's really interesting you know it's you, you, you although you had those sort of reference points you, you you were constantly chasing something that was different from the last thing that you heard and the last thing you heard might have been really exciting it might have been julian cope or the blue nile or yeah. or something like that you know there, there were all sorts of great things going about at the time there were uh, the thing that you know you could you could at one moment you could be listening to japan Mm. and gentlemen take Polaroids, that kind of thing. And the next, you'd have wire chairs missing on. So you think, okay, well, Japan's really smooth and lush. And then you listen to wire, you go, hey, do you know what? That, you can just do what you like. And with some oversight from Hugh, some quality control, mm. hence comfortable life comes about, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's right, yeah. It was all that kind of thing in there, wasn't it? I mean, it was I did all feel... stuff that was... Sorry, Dave, I did feel that the bass... Uh, in, on Blue Emotion especially is quite Japan, quite Mick Khan, if you know what I mean. It is and it isn't. I mean, yeah, yes, obviously all of that, all of that sort of bass in, in the, all that bass in the forefront was definitely part of that. But Mick Khan, don't forget, was a, was a, a fretless bass player. So there's a yeah. lot of ooh, ooh, ooh going along. There's a lot of that stuff at the time, uh, which didn't really particularly float my boat. Um, I was more interested in, in Odd things like um, that. Um, what were they called? The Young Marble Giants, which had a, a bass prominence, and um, and really, you know, the, the, the old-fashioned Motown type uh, players, and obviously Paul McCartney, who kind of you know set the thing. But also things like the Stranglers, yeah. John Jack, that kind of grunty bass bass in the forefront. That was still um, really part of part of my. Uh, you know, upbringing, I suppose. I and you have say, to say, Joy and Joy Division has to be in there as well, doesn't it? Really, it does. But the thing about Joy Division is that, that you almost need another bass player to do the bass while while he's, look, he's fiddling about in the top regions. And you know, <laughs> I, I I'm not a great fan of people who who, who stay up in the dusty end all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got to do both, really. Stanley Clark, that's another one. Stanley Clark almost needed another bass player. Oh yeah, having, but Stanley having said, Clark. But having said that, you know, all of those things where bass was not just a dum de dum in the background were a profound influence at the time, definitely. Yeah. Hi, but of course, we toured, we, we, we toured with Level 42 and had a great, um, a, well, you know, a <laughs> month long exposure to Mark King doing his thing on, uh, on, in gigs yeah. in Germany and Europe. And, uh, you know, mm. you can see how the, the bass is important. Yeah. yeah. High of History was, um, was obviously a, it's a six track. So it was a mini, like a mini LP rather than an EP, I guess, wasn't it? Um, yes. And I've got to say, like I say, this is one of my favourite um, albums from from back in the day in the 80s. And, and especially the first side, it was the, the three singles, uh, Secrets, Photography and Blue Emotion, three completely different tracks. And on Secrets, you've got um, the, the the vocals and the keyboards, um, photography, you've got the sax, and on Blue Emotion, you've got the bass. And it's it's three different types of tracks completely for me. And, and I thought... It, it was just brilliant. I don't think, and you maybe agree with me, it didn't really reach its potential um, as a as an album or as a as a release because uh, the singles didn't do they hit the lower end of the charts. But I felt personally, but I'm then I'm biased that they should have been much higher up in the charts. How do you feel about that? Um, well, this is the way it was, you know. I mean, uh, as far as as far as the actual release, if we, if, we, if we're concentrating on hired history. Hired History was really a, a release that was put out in Europe so that people could catch up with Fiat Lux before we started touring Europe. That was its intention and it was actually a Benelux release. Okay. Um, it was brought into the UK because of Polydor dithering over the actual album. So all of those, all of the, all the tunes that are on, on there had already been released in the UK as actual singles. Yeah. at the time when Hired History came out and it was a pull together and it was it only really existed in the UK I think because Polydor were dragging the heels over the album and all of those songs I think exist better when you listen to them in the context of um, of Ark of Embers which was the yeah. the album that's subsequently recently come out last year which was the, was the album, album we intended to bring out yeah. 
Um, but obviously, you know, it has to be looked at from the context of people coming across it like they did back in the 80s. And, and, and you know, it, it, it stands up on that basis. But it was it was never our intention to bring that out, really. It was just a, it was a sort of a stopgap. I mean, um, if you look at the albums you made and, mm. and Save Symmetry, for instance, um, in my eyes, is a completely different album to the to the earlier stuff you've done, and I think it's really, really good. It's a really good album. I really do like that that, that album. Thank you. And will the new album be in the same context, or is it like a step further, or same sort of um, in the same tones? Because Save Save Symmetry was quite um, mood, not I'll say moody albums, not not the right phrase really, but more of a kind of almost like a laid back album. If that probably sits about right with me. I think felt a bit laid back to me. It's a bit more introspective, isn't it? Um, yeah. And I, I think that uh, basically, the, the, you know, the, the, the new album, when it happens, will be what it is, and it'll be how we've worked on it. And people do say there is a Fiat Lux sound, and that is because we are who we are, and we have the same kind of drive and the same kind of empathy with each other. And the, the great thing about having Will with us now, and he needs a you know, special mention, is that um, he has adapted and moulded his playing with great consideration to how Ian used to play. And mm -hmm. as, as, as David and I have said before, everything we do, we always have Ian in the back of our mind. What would, what would Ian think about this? Would Ian be disgusted with this? Is this far too poppy or is this far too sort of silly? But um, actually, Ian could be quite silly, but uh, <laughs> but Will has Will has adapted and 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 accommodated that mood and that feeling, and he re he really has brought you know that that third dimension to what we do. Yes, so I think that that will be a telling difference, possibly, because Will was a basically a hired hand who who had really had much experience of us when we did Save Symmetry, whereas now he's been on the road with us and uh, is, is kind of got the idea of what it's all about I think really um, and as Steve says has is, is, is really become a comfortable pair of shoes in, in amongst the costume of Fiat Lux. <laughs> yeah. Nice way of putting it David, nice way, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> the costume but the new, of Fiat Lux. But, but I think, well I mean I think the new, the new single um, is, is, is important for what the new album is, is going to be like to some extent. Obviously there will be light and shade and different tempos on it because that's what we've always done. As, as you said, even going back to the, the original um, hired history, that is apparent that there is there is a, a breadth of, of stuff that we, we tackle, but it all sounds like Fiat Lux. Um, and that was the thing with that Polydor had trouble with, you see, Stuart. They, mm. they couldn't really put us in a pigeonhole and say, okay, you're this band, you're that band, and your tracks have to sound yeah. like this. Because we're working together, and especially with Hugh producing, the sky was the limit. If you had a mood or a or a or a feeling, then we'd, we'd do that, and it wouldn't be wouldn't be constrained by. Oh, hold on, this isn't this isn't what you do. It would be, you know, carte blanche and hence embers. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I think we've run out of time, guys. <laughs> it's, been a great, it's been great chatting to you guys. As as um, as I said to you before, big fan of the band, and the new stuff is really, really good. And I'm looking forward to hearing the new album when it comes out. And yes. uh, I do thank you very much for your time tonight. Uh, much appreciated, uh, David Pitmore hey, well, and uh, Steve Wright from Fiat Lux. Thank you, Stuart. Stuart thank you so much.